Hello Copperheads, my name is Kupri and I've been gone for so long that the seasons have changed twice from spring to summer to fall. My hair has changed twice from orange to gray to this rainbow situation and my diagnostic status is still the same. Yep, I still don't know if I'm a patient of Wilson's disease or just a carrier. Anyways, a lot has happened in the past seven months. I have been dealing with medical bureaucracy, studying for an important exam, applying for funding for a super secret, super exciting project, working on school applications, and most importantly, taking care of my physical and mental health. Thank you so much for your patience during this little break. And I am just so excited to be back here with you, my dear Wilson's disease copperheads. And on that note, let's get started. So, seven months ago on Copperhead 11, we were starting to get into the diagnostic process by learning about the eye examinations that can help determine if you have Wilson's disease or not. My goal today is to continue on that by covering four important clinical imaging techniques. And next week, I will tell you about how we can use these four techniques to find out what's happening inside your abdomen and how that can help us diagnose Wilson's disease. So, clinical imaging is the set of techniques we use in order to see what's going on inside the human body without having to cut it open. There's many types of clinical imaging techniques, but today we're only going to talk about number one, projectional radiography, number two, computerized tomography, number three, magnetic resonance imaging, and number four, ultrasonography. Let me segue into this by telling you a little bit about electromagnetic interaction, electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation, and the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic interaction is one of the four fundamental interactions that shape the entire universe. The other three are a. Gravitational interaction, which is what stops you from spontaneously lifting up the Earth and floating away into space. B. Strong nuclear interaction, which is what holds the nucleus of an atom together. And C. Weak nuclear interaction, which is what can make the nucleus of an atom fall apart. If you want a little more information about atoms and their subatomic particles, feel free to check out Copperheads 4. Anyways, back to electromagnetic interaction. You see, particles such as electrons, atoms, and molecules can have electric charges, either positive or negative. When two electrically charged particles are close enough in space, they both affect how the other one behaves, therefore producing an electromagnetic interaction. Many electrically charged particles interacting in all sorts of ways with one another produce an electromagnetic field. Electromagnetic fields travel through space as waves, and this is what we call electromagnetic radiation. Let's talk about waves for a minute. The waves in electromagnetic radiation have different properties if they have different wavelengths or frequencies. The wavelength is the distance between the peaks of a wave. Up here we have waves with a long wavelength, so they look very stretched out. And down here we have waves with a short wavelength, so they look very squished together. The frequency is the inverse of wavelength, kind of like the opposite of wavelength, and it's kind of telling you how frequently the wave passes through. Up here we have waves with a low frequency, because this wave is only passing through like three times from here to here, and down here we have waves with a high frequency, because that wave is passing through like 15 times from there to there. Now let's move on to the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is just a visual representation of all the possible wavelengths and frequencies that electromagnetic waves can have. Please remember that wavelength and frequency are inverses of each other. So in this graph, wavelength increases from left to right, and frequency increases from right to left. The small section over here is light, in other words, the kinds of electromagnetic waves that we humans can perceive with our eyes. Clean air is invisible to us because most light waves can go right through it. 
But when light encounters objects, some of the light waves are absorbed by the object and some of them bounce back out. This shirt looks red because it's bouncing back only red light and absorbing all other colors. And these pants look blue because they're bouncing back only blue light and absorbing all other colors. If these clothes looked black, it would be because they're absorbing all light waves and not bouncing back any of them. Let's go back to the electromagnetic spectrum. Here, just to the left of visible light, with a higher frequency than visible light, we have ultraviolet waves. And even more to the left, with an even higher frequency than ultraviolet waves, we have X-ray waves. X-ray waves are similar to light waves, but they can go through more stuff. For example, your clothes. When something allows most light waves to go through, we say it is transparent or translucent. And when something allows few light waves to go through, we say it is opaque. Similarly, when something allows most X-ray waves to go through, we say it is radiolucent. And when something allows few X-ray waves to go through, we say it is radiopaque. Now, there's a lot of wiggle room between completely radiolucent and completely radiopaque. So, if we want to be more precise, we can talk about radio density. Lower radio density means more radiolucent, and higher radio density means more radiopaque. Radio density as a property can be measured in units. You see, when I look at a photograph of two people, I can say, oh, this person looks taller and that person looks shorter. But that doesn't tell me anything about how many centimeters or inches tall each person actually is. Similarly, it's not very scientific to look at an X-ray image and say, oh, this part looks less radio dense and that part looks more radio dense. That's why we have units to measure radio density. The most common radio density unit is called HU, the Hounsfield unit. Different components of your body have different radio densities. For example, fat tissue has a radio density of about minus 100 HU, which is low, which means that fat is very radiolucent, which means it lets a lot of X-ray waves through. On the other hand, bone surfaces have a radio density of almost 2000 HU, which is high, which means bones are very radiopaque, which means they don't let a lot of X-ray waves through. By knowing the radio density of different stuff in your body, Doctors can look at clinical images obtained using x-ray techniques in order to understand what's going on inside of you. Out of the four clinical imaging techniques we're covering today, two of them are x-ray techniques. Number one, projectional radiography, and number two, computerized tomography. A projectional radiography is what most people are talking about when they say they got an x-ray. This is like one 2D black and white photograph taken from one angle and that's it. On the other hand, we have computerized tomography, which people usually call CT scan or CAT scan. In order to create a computerized tomography, doctors point X-ray waves at you from many different angles and then a computer puts all of that information together to generate many 2D images. These 2D images are cross-sections of your body. In other words, they show what your body, or this orange I have in my hands, would look like if you cut slices in this direction, let's call that vertically, or in this other direction, let's call that horizontally. Now I want to take you back to the electromagnetic spectrum. We have been talking about clinical imaging techniques that use X-ray waves, which are over there on the left with a higher frequency and shorter wavelength than visible light. But over here on the right, with a lower frequency and longer wavelength than visible light, we have radio waves. Radio waves are useful not just for broadcasting radio shows, uh, do people listen to traditional radios anymore? But also for number three, magnetic resonance imaging, also known as MRI. The way MRIs work has to do with electromagnetic fields being generated and radio waves bouncing around, but it's a bit more complicated than X-ray techniques. So I'm not going to explain it right now because I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information. But 
If you want to know more about how MRIs work, you can click up here for a nice little video by MagLab. 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 That's hard to say. Finally, let's talk about number four, ultrasonography, also called ultrasound or sonogram. Ultrasonography uses sound waves, which have nothing to do with the electromagnetic waves we have been talking about so far in this video, even though they're also waves. Sound waves are created when physical objects vibrate and transmit those vibrations to the particles in the air. The sound waves travel through the air until they reach, for example, your ears or this microphone I'm using to record myself right now. The same way that ultraviolet waves have a frequency too high to be perceived by human eyes, ultrasound waves have a frequency too high to be perceived by human ears. When we use an ultrasound device for clinical imaging, the device sends ultrasound waves, records how and when the waves echo back, and uses that information to generate an image. All right, so now you know a lot more about number one, projectional radiography, number two, computerized tomography, number three, magnetic resonance imaging, and number four, ultrasonography. But I still haven't actually shown you what kinds of images these techniques produce. So let's fix that right now. Let me take you over to radiopedia.org, which is a super cool website where healthcare professionals from all over the world can submit real clinical images of both healthy people and people with different conditions. Let's have a look at some healthy abdomens, shall we? Abdomen number one, with projectional radiography. As you can see here, a projectional radiography is really good at showing us the bones, but organs are a lot harder to see. Thankfully, Dr. Jeremy Jones, who posted these images, took the time to annotate them down here. So in blue, we have the liver to the left and the spleen to the right. In yellow, we have the kidneys, and in red, we have different sections of the intestines. Abdomen number two, with computerized tomography. Now, this is a bit special because this person was given radio contrast agents, which are not always used during a CT scan. When we do use radio contrast agents, they are usually given orally by mouth or intravenously into the blood, and they just help things look crisper in X-ray-based imaging techniques. The cool thing about a CT scan is that we don't have just a single image, but many little cross sections of the abdomen. Check out how awesome it looks when I use this slider on the side to look at the cross sections from back to front. There we have liver, one kidney, some intestines, the hips, the spine, the rib cage, and so on. We can also go here and look at the cross sections from top to bottom. There's the liver, kidneys, and so on. Abdomen number three, with magnetic resonance imaging. Similarly to CT scans, MRIs also show us cross sections of the human body. In this case, both from back to front and from top to bottom. But you can see here that the same kind of tissue can look different between images, like this fat tissue is lighter here and darker there and so on. That's just because the MRI machine uses different settings to capture the inside of your body in different ways. And finally, abdomen number four with ultrasonography. Honestly, this is the hardest one, so I am very thankful to Dr. Henry Knipp for annotating this for us. There's some liver, 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 gallbladder, right kidney, left kidney, and so on. That was a lot for you and me both after a seven month break. So let's call it a day for now. And please, please, please come back next week to find out how these four clinical imaging techniques can be used to figure out what's happening inside your abdomen and how that can help us confirm or exclude a Wilson's disease diagnosis. In the meantime, you can find me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, or by email. My name is Kupri. See you there, Copperheads.